AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Jendai Harris, and she is going to be talking about something that I just love the sound of. We're going to find out more about what that is, Chabology. Please welcome Jendai. Nice to meet you. Hello, Chef AJ. I'm so excited to meet you. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, thank you for reaching out. I love when authors contact me because it's just, it's how would I know about you otherwise? And I can't wait to hear about all your work and your books and what you do and what Chabology. I love the name. It sounds adorable, but... <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm really excited to be here. And I basically my ministry is all about inspiring wholeness and freedom in every area of life. But one of my biggest, hardest struggles, similar to you, was food addiction and just overcoming what I call the weight and eating mountain. And it's a huge mountain that's obviously very dynamic, involves food, involves emotions, involves healing and everything. So I wanted to um focus my attention on built and, and helping people like myself that have just had significant trauma and dysfunction and needed to overcome the food issue and the weight, what I call weight and eating issue, because it's more than food um, in our lives. So thank you so much. You're, you have been a huge inspiration to me. I look up to you. I admire you and you're like a mentor from afar. So it's a big day for me to oh, be on the show. Oh my God. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You look amazing. Did you, did you struggle with your weight? Absolutely. I struggled big time with weight my entire life. Um, I'm so excited to be on the other side of just having freedom, weight and eating freedom and total freedom in my life. Um, and that's what I want for everybody, wholeness and freedom in their body, soul, spirit and every area of life. Yeah, well, I've listened to a few podcasts with you and you talk about how there's a difference between a diet mindset and a freedom mindset. That's right. Yes. And um, that's part of it. You know, um, in my first book, this is called The Chubby Church. Um, I do have a religious orientation or a, a, a for people. However, um, I've had friends that are Buddhist, Muslim, and said or read the book and just relate it to their different, you know, spirituality principles, Jewish, et cetera. And what I love is that um, in writing this, it's a body, soul, spirit thing, right? So in the soul, the soul has to do with your mind, your choices, your emotions, all, all of that. And what's so amazing is that we have these mindsets and beliefs that are completely sabotaging us when it comes to how we eat and how we think about our bodies, our health, et cetera. So that's what I call the dieter's mindset that for me personally had to break off things like, you know, if I mess up one part, I have to ruin the whole day and just go on a free will binge. Right. Or if I, um, or food is bad projecting my low self-esteem onto food. And yes, there is, as you already know, there's food that is honestly non-food <laughs> and processed food that anything from the standard American diet is not going to lead you to health. We all know that from watching the show. Um, but when we really have a mindset that's working against us, beliefs working against us, body image working against us, a soul shame uh, working against us, that stuff needs to be resolved. So my hope is to support um, those on the journey to that wholeness and freedom in their weight and eating to get full completeness of their healing, including the mind. Right. It's funny you call it standard American diet. When I've interviewed people of faith before, like Nathaniel Jordan, the minister of wellness, he calls it the satanic abuse diet. Yeah. And I call it the satanic addictive deception um, and Satan's agenda of death. And I'm very clear because there, you know, obviously this, the sofas that you teach and preach on. Um, but there's all kinds of addictive ingredients in our culture that are acceptable and available at every street corner. Um, so what we, what I look at is how do we, as a, co a collective of addictive ingredients and foods, how do we really overcome that as well? And you're the expert in that space of helping people practically learn how to eat and cook and, and such. Yeah, well, it just kind of goes back to eating what the Bible said to eat pulses, you know, things like just if we just ate food, we wouldn't have this problem, but we're, we're not eating food anymore. Preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, that's so preaching to the choir. I love that. I love that. So uh, did, did you also struggle with binging when you had yeah, a weight problem? Absolutely. I talk about um, one of my things when I started noticing the binging was actually with a cookies uh, from Burger King. So years ago, I was just, I couldn't stop eating chocolate chip cookies. These net, they were Nestle Toll House cookies at the Burger King in New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. I live in Denver, Colorado now. 
And what was fascinating is like, I was eating cookies for breakfast, for lunch and for dinner. Okay. <laughs> and I could, you know, the one more time, one more time, which is the sign of addiction in the brain, right? Um, the food's highly palatable. It's going to be addictive in the brain. So I just couldn't stop eating these cookies. And obviously that's binge eating. It's a part of eating where we can't stop and would stop ourselves. Um, another time when I learned about emotional fitness, which is what I termed for what I was doing to myself. For example, there was a time I ate like two whole food slices of pizza, some ice cream, a Cinnabon, all in one setting. And that may not be a big deal to some of you, but it basically exploded me and caused me to call a therapist like it was 911. <laughs> I go to the therapist, we get to the heart of my binge. And guess what was there? It was the fact that my father was murdered when I was 12 and was missing, you know, the current situation, which was my husband's absence triggered the binge, which triggered, which was the root of some of my father's um, absence and death and murder 20 years prior to that binge episode. So it gave me a different perspective on binge eating. I never ate like that again, even when I wanted to, after learning how to heal um, those major episodes of binge eating. So absolutely, I'm recovered. <laughs> uh, we're, we're getting, we're gearing up to start the third year of the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, and lots of the experts talk about trauma. Yeah, and that's the heart of it, right? That soul shame trauma, overcoming it, and having it from again, you have to deal with it from a food perspective, right? You can't, we can't keep eating the addictive foods and expect to change because we do have addictive things that we need to overcome and making, you know, not making excuses, learning how to care for the body and then learning how to care for your soul as well yeah. and spirit. Um, so oftentimes there's, there's more than one. Uh, again, this is multi-dynamic issue when you're talking about weight reduction and weight. Well, how do weight and food issues affect people's spiritual lives? Um, so many ways, because we just like we're hungry for physical food we actually have spiritual hunger because we are spiritual beings right inside of our human bodies. There's a part of us all connected to higher power source, God. Um, I'm a Christian Christ, Christ follower. So I just love the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but there is a part of every single human that we can develop a spiritual side, or we can stuff it down and dormant it and oppress it. But all of us have a spiritual nature, just like we have a physical body and a emotional nature and a physical need for food. There's spiritual food that feeds us as well. Gratitude, love, connection, nourishment, prayer, um, meditation. So there's lots of um, ways we don't, we quench our spiritual soul and voice um, just like we would um, emotionally. Nice. When did you write your book? Um, I wrote my book in March. I wrote it forever, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I published it in March of 2019. So just, um, which was a huge victory. And I have the second one coming March of this year, um, Chubby Church 2. So Chubby Church 1 focuses on the um, kind of foundational principles for wholeness and freedom. And using this issue, a lot of people struggle with this issue, as you know, um, but they don't look at it as a path of healing and growth. Like the, this is your path. This isn't part of your overcoming. This is part of you rising to that greatness and potential that's inside of you. And God's just using your weight and eating issues to do it um, and to heal and become truly healthy um, in all ways. Now, book two is about, so that's the foundational just on whole and free health and how do you get there? And then there is book two, which is, I call it um, in order, in order to win the seven battles of the weight and eating war uh, for good. <laughs> and those battles are, you know, food addiction, overcoming, um, overeating and binge eating, under eating, uh, unclean eating from a biblical and just the chemical perspective, and then also body image and soul shame and genetic predispositions, which you're quoted in several times, chef. So oh. I have you. Oh, well then she so, should have had me endorse it. I'd be a little, <laughs> if I'm in it, I'd be happy to endorse it. That's, I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Oh yeah, you're in it. I'm like, oh. I got your family. So, you know, you just, you're so impactful in this space. So oh my God. Well, you. thank you. That's because I too suffered for so long and I don't want other people to have to go down that path, especially knowing what we know now. Nobody knew about food addiction when I was growing up and eating, you know, in touch 
entire, not just sleeves, but the whole thing of Oreos. I mean, one thing if I ate the sleeve, but there were three sleeves. I could eat all three sleeves. You know it, sister. Yeah, and then when they came out with double stuff, oh boy, <laughs> that was even uh, worse. You can even do that on healthy foods. I mean, like, even if you, you've overcome some of the traditional packaging and processed foods, they're still, I was eating organic whole foods cookies, right? <laughs> like, oh yeah, they're organic, but they're still fattening. They're still filled with sugar and flour and going to cause you to binge eat. So even if they're not the Oreos and the double stuffed and all the Doritos and all of that, they're still healthy foods we binge on. You know, you can binge on dates. Yeah, absolutely. How do we teach people to love themselves and their bodies while they're still wanting to change them? Yeah, I love that question because as you know, it's like loving yourself. The first thing I want to give a tip to you, uh, uh, those of you listening, um, your relationship with you is one of the most important relationships you have outside of hopefully a spiritual one. And one of the best ways to start loving yourself is to look in the mirror and simply say, I love you. When you're brushing your teeth, doing your hair, um, when you're looking in the mirror, start, first of all, start looking in it, look into your own eyes. Don't allow that body shame to, or just that rejection, self-rejection to keep happening. Oh, my nose is too big, or I need to lose weight. I need to do that. all that is actually hindering your progress, which this, you know, bottom line is you do need to learn to love yourself. So you might as well start today. So look in the mirror and whenever you pass a mirror, smile, start to give yourself self-validation. And I simply say, I love you. And it's really hard as a therapist. I walk people through this exercise and it's so powerful to just forgive yourself and look into your eyes and begin to build that relationship with self because it helps every other relationship in your life, including your relationship with food. So when you, um, that's the first tip I would say to how to learn how to love yourself is start looking in your own eyes smiling at yourself, saying something encouraging and starting with the simple words, I love you. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the work of Louise Hay and she talks about mirror work a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yep. neat. Um, how do you help people achieve their health goals by aligning them with their spiritual principles? Um, by aligning them with their spiritual principles. I mean, a lot of people know that they internally know that some of the non-foods are not their best self or their highest path, right? So we can't escape that still small voice inside of us that says, I'm not treating my body right because it is a spiritual principle, no matter what your faith, um, to know there's something sacred, holy and special about your physical being. And so just connecting to whatever your, um, whatever your spiritual uh, guidelines are uh, to that part of you that's connected to say, I need to treat myself better. You know, that's why we have all these diets that fail and things of that nature, because people are trying, they're trying to hear and do better. We just don't know exactly how. Why did purely physical approaches to dieting often fail for people? Yeah, they do. Don't they? Um, and I, um, let me show you a slide actually, cause, um, that can help. Um, so just a few things, I'll go a little back before forward, but again, that's me, Jendai Harris or Jay for short, and you can get your goodie bag at chub, the chubby um, And for me, as you can see, one of the things you said is like the physical, right? We take this physical only approach and yet there's all this other parts of us and it's a dynamic, dynam dynamic thing. So inner transformation is gonna produce body revelation. Um, meaning allowing that internal healing, coming to authenticity, being real. We stop eating, you know, we can eat fake foods because we're actually being fake <laughs> and not ourselves. We haven't embraced ourselves yet. So that inner, we lean on kind of forcing it from the outside, like this guy in, um, you remember this movie, uh, what's it called? Professor Clump, <laughs> the nutty professor. And he was drinking that potion, right? To try to slim down and be Bobby and all hip and sexy and everything. Um, but we try to manipulate the body. So we really manipulate it when we're trying just from a habit ac action perspective, it's a mindset. So the dieter's mindset is like, okay, it let's, let's, um, you know, let's just work on, you know, let's be, let's drink water, let's get sleep, let's eat vegetables, and 
let's get our bake our potatoes, right? That's what the dyer's mindset is trying to do. Only it's short lived because we haven't transformed the belief like the be do have principle. We haven't necessarily transformed that belief that I am healthy. A dieter starts Monday, it's over Monday afternoon um, because we're trying to do these habits without really looking underneath it for the paradigm, the mindsets that really help us embrace our true being that we're not defective, we are enough and we are healthy, we are whole and free. And it seems counterintuitive. I have all this weight. How am I ever going to be healthy? But the more we start believing we're healthy and adopting that belief, we're going to start doing healthy habits out of a place of health, not at a place of and, and health and acceptance and love, instead of a place of this force and aggression and rejection, self-rejection, that's going to produce habits that are not necessarily lasting change when our mindset, our beliefs are not exactly in order. Okay. So that's where I see body manipulation happening where you're trying to force the body. But what we really need to do is fit our soul, fit our soul. Who are you? Who are you called to be? Who are you going to be in the world? How is this issue going to heal you and allow you to come to that greatness that's already packed inside of you? Nice. I like that inner transformation leads to body revelation. Yes. Yes. And just learning how to fit who we are instead of trying to keep being, you know, getting skinny to please everybody else. We really want to use the journey for total health, total emotional, mental, spiritual, physical wellness. What did you mean by be, do, have principles? Okay. Be, do, have is a principle that's focused on beliefs, create, uh, um, doing, like what, who we believe we are, what we're thinking, our mindsets, our paradigms produce what we actually are doing and our habits that we're creating the actions. Those actions create what we have or the results we get, right? So those results, so the be, do, have, and a lot of us are trying to have lower blood pressure, <laughs> um, you know, ward off chronic diseases. We're trying to, uh, get skinny, <laughs> lower those numbers on the scale. We're trying to have that, but we, and we're trying to do habits. Let's do everything Chef AJ said, right? Which is awesome, which you should do. Everything Jay says, um, everything all these wonderful leaders that you have on the show say, but then the reality is they have, it's short lived. The actions, the doing is short lived. Therefore the results don't fully attain because we haven't gotten the be, the being, being healthy, the being whole, the being free um, yet. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Did you want, did you have more slides to share? Yeah, sure. Oh, great. No, I just didn't. I just, it just, if you didn't, I would like wanted you to take yourself off just so we can see you. But Monica said, could you please say what formats your book is available? Is it just paperback or does it also come in hardcover or audible? Yes, it's in audible, it's in paperback and it's in Kindle. It's not hardcover yet. Great. Thank you. All right. But I love, I love, you know, audible books. Some people have said it's really easy, especially when you get to the soul session, it's the soul section. It's really hard to put down. Nice. So, yeah, so we're body, soul, spirit, and this is just a glimpse of what that means, but our soul is really what I want to emphasize. So you're so much more um, than your physical body. In fact, your soul's way bigger, way multifaceted, already walking in abundance and freedom. That's your soul. It has the truth. But there's little tears and traumas that we've experienced, and there's events, and there's emotions, and there's things um, that we've experienced that are like little tears in the soul. Um, but to overcome, we can't. We can overcome. Number one, a lot of you have overcome listening to this show. Um, but our over overcoming this is a true mountain and it must be holistic and comprehensive because it's multifaceted issue. So if you're doing well one day and not the next, and you want to manifest that fullness of joy, you can experience in your right size body and your healthy, healthiest body, you're looking your most beautiful, most attractive. We want to get to some of those other roots in the area, you know, food, there's several different roots from a physical soul, you know, spiritual perspective. Um, and these books, both of them are necessary to overcome 
the Weight and Eating Mountain. Book two will be published soon and you can join my mailing list at thechubbychurch.com. And again, there is a Christian um, component, scriptural component um, to it, but again, several faiths have read it. So those root issues, again, if we don't like the fruit, we look at the roots. And Chubology, I wanted to talk about a bit today, and that's weight and eating psychology. Now, we use weight um, to protect uh, our soul. So because our soul is inside of us, we can't see it. Your soul lives inside the physical body, right? So it's like you move into a house that you never leave until you die. So when you come into the earth and you're in your mama's womb, you get birth and you're inside of that soul ever since that in that womb experience and into the world. And until you leave, uh, when you pass away, you're still um, in that body, right? So your soul's home never moves. It's always in your physical body. So we you can use the body as a way to protect our souls because we don't feel safe in the world. When we've gone through trauma, um, physical abuse, verbal and emotional abuse are, when I've done classes on this stuff, is fascinating in my surveys because 84% of those in what I call weight and eating bondage um, have had mostly verbal abuse, critical verbal abuse, um, whether it's about their physical bodies or about themselves. Uh, they've also had emotional abuse where they felt shut down, lack of emotional support, even more than physical, actual physical abuse. So that was interesting to me um, to find, but we protect our soul with food. So we eat the food, we do the grubology, which I'll have to talk about another time, but we have grubology where we're like stuffing with food, binging, et cetera, to give ourselves love and comfort and fun and, you know, all the, and, you know, safety, but we also have that manifestation of these chubby suits that we're just struggling to get out of. Um, in obesity, overweightness, and what we're trying to do with the physical fat on our body is protect our souls because we don't feel safe in the world. And this is what I went through and how I overcame my chubby suit and finally took it off for good. Um, and some of these areas, I'm gonna share more in a moment, but we also use our chubby suit, um, again, overall for protection and safety but also to prove and validate the soul's beliefs about the self. So if I believe, which I did for many years, I'm worthless, I'm defective, I'm ugly, okay, which obviously is a lie, thank God. <laughs> but if I believe these things, I'm going to um, prove that with creating struggle in my life with food and with weight. So let me give you some trouble logical triggers and I'm sorry, but I have a typo I have to fix really quick. Okay, um, <laughs> um, but chubological triggers. So one of them that's really important for embracing our beauty, Chef AJ, is unwanted attention. Now, when we don't, we do, our threat, we can have our attractiveness as a threat. Therefore, we eat a lot to cover it up, right? Do you understand what I mean there? Because it's a part of us that we have had hurt, harm. So if you've been through impossible causes, right, our sexual assault, um, not feeling comfortable with the opposite sex, like you, you get nervous or you feel intimidation, maybe you had an abusive father or maybe you have an absent dad or maybe you have an abusive mother, um, but you don't feel comfortable to be yourself around the opposite sex or you feel intimidated. Um, these are parts of us where our beauty has caused us harm. Maybe we went through um, self-sexual abuse, I call promiscuity or childhood molestation or, some, or incest, things like that, that can create us to want to cover up with weight. Now, again, we have true physical issues of addictive foods, but if you feel like you have a deeper issue in your, your chubology, your weight and eating psychology, um, attractiveness is a real threat that makes us want to wear the chubby suit. And so we have to get comfortable. Another one is sexual lust. Yes, if you feel like you can't trust yourself, I had a client named Jim, well, that's a fake name, but yes, a client, a guy who had a lot of sexual uh, attention, right? So he didn't want to cheat on his wife 
So he started gaining weight and his root of the issue was he wasn't, he had his sexual lust that he didn't know how to bridle and control unless he had that extra weight on him um, to keep his marriage intact, but it was not attractive for his wife. So there are some, that's a real issue when we don't know how to deal with our sexual lust um, in life. Another is emotional intimacy uh, is a big threat. When we have, when I was in a relationship in the past, um, my first marriage, I'm soon to be, uh, you know, into my second marriage, um, but there is an emotional intimacy component where we feel so vulnerable and that vulnerability is a trigger to start eating and creating self-protection with weight um, because we're just afraid to bear our souls. And when we think about the most vulnerable places and points we've had in life, uh, we can see easily why we may not feel safe, especially if you couldn't be vulnerable with parents or friends early in life, you're gonna have trouble being vulnerable uh, in relationship and saying your truth, like, oh man, I, I said that because I was scared. Um, that's what I mean by emotional intimacy, letting intimacy is into me see, letting somebody really see you and see that, that child part of you that really just needs love and care. Um, I'll stop there for a moment, um, Chef, in case you have any questions. Do, do you, I'm just curious, how, do you work with people one-on-one -on, -one on this? Do you work in groups? Um, how do you I, I, yeah, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> um, I mainly focus on writing. And I do have, if you join my mailing list, I have some classes, courses, groups, stuff coming up, but mostly in groups now, because my main goal is to spread the message. Right. Well, here's an interesting question from Donna. And, and before I let you answer, Jendai, I want to give an answer that I heard from uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Doug Lyle. But what if you really are not attractive? And I want to say, Donna, if, if you, there is a wonderful podcast called Beat Your Genes on Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time, there's probably 200 episodes by Dr. Doug Lyle. And he actually has a whole podcast devoted to that. And he gives some amazing advice on, on that. But I'm going to see what Jendai has to say. Okay, so basically, if you feel like you're really not attractive, that's what that's what Donna asks. Okay, yeah, I you, I don't know. A lot of times, it depends on how you're measuring your attractiveness and what are you measuring it to, because there's only one of you. So, by whose standards are you not attractive? Is my point. And if you're here on the planet, um, you know, it's kind of like he, each human being is one out of the seven point whatever billion humans there are, that means there's only one of you. So if there's only one of you, the only standard to truly measure against is itself. And so we believe a lot of lies, frankly. And one of the lies is we need to be attractive to be like the people we see, the 1% on television. And as long as we keep holding on to the lie that we're not attractive, we're gonna keep believing that I'm not attractive, so why bother? But will we be more attractive if we took care of ourselves, if we believed we were attractive, if we were believed we were attractive enough for our own self? So part of your identity is your face and how you look. And the only one who truly can, um, who we can truly measure against is our own self because there's only one of you. So I would brace more truth in that. And again, look at the standards you're following because the world standards are Photoshopped, frankly. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is I, one of the ways I'd answer that is I think what is attractive in people is health. And when you pursue health, you, you, you become more attractive. So true. And you feel so much better, right? So your like vibrancy attracts to, to us too. And your character, right? There's so much more about you than how you physically look and honoring that as attractive. So you right. can look really good and really have a horrible attitude and the beauty just isn't there. Yeah, it's such a such an interesting uh, topic. A lot of people are just saying you have flawless, beautiful skin. If you have any secrets on that, uh, makeup and <laughs> <laughs> um, thank God for makeup. No, um, I think a lot of my skin has benefited from eating how you say a lot of raw food, nutrition, and lots of vegetables, lots of good healthy starches. Um, for just dietary, no, sh no sugar, not a lot of chocolate. Chocolate for me has not been good for my skin. Dairy has been terrible. I've 
cutting out dairy and all the standard American addictive fare uh, really has hugely benefited my skin and youthfulness. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've noticed the same thing, as, especially as I age. Yes. <laughs> yeah, neat. Yeah, that, this is just a fascinating topic. I just, the, the whole word chibology, I'm wondering uh, how, are, how are the churches taking, if they are knowing about, you know, you calling their churches chubby? Because Dr. Uh, Nathaniel Jordan, the Minister of Wellness, basically when he came on the show, he said, going to church makes you fat. <laughs> I highly want people to go to church. I just want us to also realize that some of those sins, self-harm we've done, um, transfer, right? So in the church, you know, drinking, drugging is not acceptable, <laughs> but eating is completely acceptable. And it's the one area that we just protect, right? And it's still um, a part of a part of us. And I can only say that chubby, I'm the pastor of the Chubby Church because I was a member. I was its founding member, right? So yeah, it's, they, uh, some, some laugh, you know, I've used to train this at Potter's house for years in Denver and it, I got a lot of chuckles from the chubby church and I love a sense of humor and you know that chef AJ, cause you're so funny. Um, but <laughs> that, so my books are have humor in them and hopefully you'll enjoy the non-edible goodies in it yeah. too. Well, it's not so much that going to church makes you fat. It's the potlucks that they have after and the donuts and the standard American diet or the satanic addictive deception fair um, that we just don't don't have the awareness and knowledge on. It would be great if we could get all the ministers to to adopt this healthy eating so that they can preach it. That's right. That's right. That's where we have to stop is on top and work our way to the congregation. Yeah. 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 Uh, Karen says, I could eat a whole box of Girl Scout Thin Mints in about 15 minutes. That's the other thing. Those little cute Girl Scouts, those are, they're drug pushers. And we create, we, we are like, they're so cute. We need a box. We have to buy a box. No, you don't. You can, you can just donate the cash. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep- Give them the money, but, but, but keep tell them to keep their cookies. All the, all the excuses we make, right. To grab that, that fair. Yeah, I just want to thank Donna Butler for her super chat donation. She writes, your shows are so helpful to, to developing a comprehensive, healthy self. Thank you. Yeah, we try to look at it from all kinds of angles, spiritual, physical, all that stuff, psychological. Yeah. So how do, pe- how do you, you know, a lot of people with trauma, how, how, do, how do you suggest they heal from it without food? Yeah, I, I think the best thing, you know, for healing from trauma is, is getting therapeutic support through it and talking through it and what you've been through. I love sharing stories because a lot of times the the shame, it's the shame from the trauma, right? It's the shame that we've adopted, what we believed about ourselves as we've gone through the trauma. So your goal is to kind of restructure your self-concept, how you see yourself and start to get support in sharing what you've been through and getting the shame out of it. When we spring it to light and we start to share it, again, ideally with professional help, um, we're, we're gonna be able to start overcoming it. So, you know, I had carried so much shame, right? About my past, what I've been through, you know, all of the things I've done that I was not proud of, um, but no secrets, like coming out of all your secrets um, in a professional setting, a professional care, uh, making that investment in yourself and doing what you're doing, c- coming to programs like this to support reading books has helped me a lot. Like the road less traveled, starting to understand my fears, my fear of success, my fear of my, what I call the whole self. We have a fear of our whole self, of our greatest self, like Miriam Williamson said, um, that you know we fear our greatness and our light and what good we can do and really embracing what that could mean for yourself. So that's how you come out of trauma and restructuring um, how the trauma has made you who you are today. And as you embrace, like we talked about the mirror exercise and um, saying, I love you in the mirror, learning how to have a healthy relationship with self, you're going to start to restructure how you see yourself, believe how you be- what you believe about yourself. And that's how you really walk through trauma with help. I'm certified in trauma treatment and care and one of there's, it's a physical presence of trauma. So it hides in the body. 
um, in some of the, the chub that we carry, or even if you don't have any chub, it's still in there in our hearts, our spirits, how we're dealing with the world, relationships, work. Um, so it's important to just dive in and deal with the shame, the guilt, the trauma, the past, um, and to a place where you can actually share it freely, then you know you're healed. When you're not crying about it, you're not fearful of it, you're not scared of judgment around it, but you're able to share what happened to you um, in a healthy way. Okay. So, so there you go. Lori says, well, how do we find good therapists? Uh, are you familiar with EMDR? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. EMDR is a great mode um, to help you uh, with connecting the brain to get to some of those deeper places of trauma. I also love uh, clinical hypnotherapy that helped me a lot where you're not like, you know, sedated or anything, but it does help you to tap into those memories that are haunting you uh, that need to be healed. And we, um, the memory or pictures are so powerful in the brain. So like, again, we only, we have all these pictures in the brain, but when we are able to heal what those images, those memories have taught us about ourselves. So for example, um, one of my clients was really abused by her dad. He called her um, fat as a young girl. So how is she supposed to believe otherwise, right? So he called her these terrible names as a young, young girl. So in her mind, she believed them about herself and had to overcome that through the different images of him yelling at her and calling her those names. Um, so getting behind that. Um, so there's lots of psychological ways, how to find a good therapist. I love psychology today. That's super helpful or referrals, you know, dealing with people who if eating is a struggle for you or whatever your primary issue is, alcohol, eating, whatever it is, relationship, codependency, that's what you want as a primary in the therapist's credentials um, so that they know the issue and can help you overcome and work through it. Yeah. You know, if these issues of trauma notwithstanding, don't, don't you think that part of the problem is the fact that the food is just so addictive? So even if somebody didn't have trauma or abuse, right. once they, you know, once they get into those food addicted waters, it's hard to, it's hard, hard to swim out. Exactly. And that's why, again, it's not just emotional. It's a physical fact. If you keep eating addictive foods, you'll be addicted to food. It's really, <laughs> it's actually not complicated, but it is simply because our culture is so tempting. You know, it's so tempting everywhere you go. What I love in your program, your fabulous, you know, over 40 program, right? Your, your different support that you offer chef AJ is that you know, you're dealing with that main source of food struggle, which is addictive foods and getting those addictive foods out. Um, whether you get them out or not, there's still emotional healing that may need to happen um, for just life, for your best life um, to happen. So, yeah. Right. So not don't do one or the other. Got to do both. In other words. Yes. Nice. Holistic is going to help you as a holistic health coach. It's putting it all together, walking it all out, you know, looking at the emotional roots as well as the actual what you're eating, <laughs> which creates, you know, unnecessary health problems um, is, is important. Learning how to deal with food, meal plan, all those, all those things need to be in place. I prefer people work on food more than they do their exercise because when they get the food, which predicts, you know, 90% of the results you get is what you're eating. And when you learn how to eat well and eat real food, eat good, clean, um, awesome vegetables and, you know, variety of raw and cooked like Chef AJ recommends and all her delicious recipes as your treats, um, you're going to see positive results in your weight. But if you find yourself sabotaging, that's where this conversation comes in, uh, where you don't see the results, you're not manifesting, you keep binge eating. That's where you need that deeper work. Absolutely. Do you recommend keeping those foods out of the home? Oh, you know it. You know it. I love what you say all the time. I think I quoted you in my second book is if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. <laughs> and, you know, and if you're living with a food addict, that's difficult too, right? If you're living with somebody who's not ready to change, um, working, controlling the environment is so critical for success. And I don't know why people still buy a bunch of processed foods and bring it home to everybody. And women predict, you know, 80 do 80% of the shopping. And you know what, it's like getting focusing on real meals, right, and getting some of the snack food or snacks 
out of the way. I love that sin accident. I never heard that. That's precious. Yeah, I heard it somewhere and I just went with it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I didn't relapse. I didn't relapse. I just had a snack accident. <laughs> it's an accident. It's happen all the time when there's snacks around. <laughs> that, that, that makes it, it does, takes a lot of the shame out of it. It was just a snack accident. That's neat. What are you drinking? I'm dr This is what I'm drinking. I'm drinking water. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just drinking water. water. And lemon. Water, lemon, and a straw. That looks good. Water, lemon, and a straw. Nice. Do, a little, do, you, do you enjoy cooking? Um, I do. I actually love cooking. I have a little, I started a little cooking show. I haven't really developed it yet, but it's on, it's online. It's called Kelleresta and it's just a bunch of kale recipes, but some of them were pre on learning about Chef AJ. <laughs> so, so is it on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Yeah. Because maybe when your next book comes out, you can talk about your next book, but maybe make a recipe. Uh-huh. Yes. That's neat. I can't. Oh, I just, I'm a simple chef. I'm like, I just do kale, collards, chard in a bowl, add some stuff to it and call it a day. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Well, greens are so important. I think yeah, I love that. My favorite, what's your favorite green? Mine's rainbow chard. Nice. Um, I would say collards. Yeah. Collards, I love the sturdiness of collards, but I just, I think the reason I like rainbow chard is just the, the color. Yeah, it's very free. <laughs> yeah, but I agree with you about weight uh, exercise. We're going to be talking a lot about that in the upcoming Truth About Weight Loss Summit is, you know, you can't, you can't outrun your knife and fork. Mm -hmm. Yep, but I'm, I'm guessing you probably do some kind of exercise. I love exercise. I was a yo-yo exerciser chef. So I would exercise for a day. I was off the next year. So similar to yo-yo dieting, I was a yo-yo exerciser. So to get free from that in 09, I started to keep a sticker board because we, if we really want to see change, we have to track it in some way, right? So I started keeping like a calendar and keeping little stickers for when I worked out. So I was like, okay, I'm going to overcome yo-yo exercising. I want to be consistent. I want to work out three times a week, every week. And so that was my goal. Just when I worked out, even if it was five minutes, so accepting that some is better than none. And then when I worked out celebrating, yay, I get a sticker, which is exciting and positive reinforcement. And then when I didn't work out, here's the trick. When you don't do it, instead of shaming and beating yourself up, just be indifferent. <laughs> don't beat yourself up about it. No, you'll get back on it the next day. Yeah. Your goal is consistency, um, consistency to keep it consistent, to get, keep going. Even when you don't feel like, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like working out today, but I did right. Got up, you know, I pray about it, get some energy that way and <laughs> go get it done. Um, but exercise has been, and also disconnecting exercise from weight has been hugely helpful. So connecting exercise to emotional health, to better eating. Cause when I exercise, I eat better than when I don't. Um, connecting it to body esteem. So when we exercise, we actually feel better about our physical bodies. So you struggle with body image issues, which most of us have and do. Um, and then it also helps you with your productivity. Now in my full-time job, I'm a fortune, I'm fortune 500 productivity consultant. So I love productivity. I love anything around efficiencies. And one of the things I love about exercise is I get a lot more done. <laughs> so connecting it to other things other than weight will help you to become consistent as well as tracking it visually on a calendar um, has been keeping me exercising since 09. And now I exercise, I love to exercise every day, honestly. Um, and then I limit it like uh, in the past I could binge exercise, but now I have, you have so much energy from eating how chef AJ recommends and all her people recommend. And I recommend um, you have so much energy that it's a benefit of health, right? You got to move. So that's a huge benefit of clean, healthy eating. No, I agree. I, and again, we don't exercise to lose weight. It, we just, it just makes you feel so much better. And, it, it, and it, I think it makes it easier to stick to a healthy eating plan because it improves it. Like the, the lady that said, well, what if you're not uh, attractive? The thing is, is are you really not attractive or you just don't feel you're not attractive? Exercise m makes you look better. It just does. I don't know how it does it, but it really does. It really does. Yeah. And that's the stats say that too. The body positivity increases when we exercise. So because I, yeah, because it increases your self-esteem. And then if you have higher self-esteem, you think you, I mean, there are people that probably don't look good, but they think they look great. So you look awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I love the sticker idea. We do that in some of our classes. When people eat vegetables for breakfast, they get a sticker. And it's like, if you don't, you, you, there's no punishment. You just don't get a sticker that day. It's like, you know, no big deal. But it, but it is fun when you see them all, especially if you get stickers you like. Like I, I like Scooby-Doo, so I always get Scooby-Doo stickers. Or Yeah, or I mean, you can like get that. stickers of bacon and ice cream, right? Just don't, don't eat it. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I'm looking for your YouTube channel. I'm on YouTube. And so what, what's the name of it again? I don't really do a ton yet. I'm just starting out. So um, whole and free, whole and free TV is the name of the YouTube, but there's other stuff on there. I speak on a lot of topics. That's okay. I just want to, if you, if you're doing a cooking thing that I want to see it. Oh, there I see. I see it. Cause okay. All right. Well, we get you more subscribers if you like. Nice. Very yeah. nice. Oh yeah. You have curly hair in that one. No, I think you have great presentation style. So that's good. I just want to see your cooking videos. Okay. Calaresta is called. Um, it, it is on that channel. Yeah, it's somewhere on there. You can okay. Google it. Yep. So. Here it is. How to cook kale quickly and easily with seven recipes. I'm going to link to that one because that'll be a fun one. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, thanks for telling me about that. I had no idea. Yeah. And that's uh, my mom and I wanted to do a cooking show called Redeeming the Time because we had, she is a um, pain pill addict for 20 plus years. And so the kitchen can be a place for, we're for restoration of family as well as health. And I like to teach recipes um, with a variety. So I'm, I'm considered mostly vegan, um, but not totally mostly raw vegan, but not totally. Um, and just kind of, I give myself total freedom and flexibility with what I want to eat and just simply don't want addictive foods. Uh, but there's in that show and my concept was around, you know, healing too in the kitchen. And so there's some fun conversations there because we're not a chef AJ's. We are not experienced whatsoever. We're simply everyday people that, <laughs> that want to help people become healthy in an easy way. Nice. Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm there. Anybody want to promote kale? That is great for me. Have, have, um, has, have any churches responded to your book at all? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of seminars. I call them kingdom health seminars. So yes, I would love to speak more at churches. Now that I'm done book two, I'm ready to promote. I was working on these. They're, they're re really well researched. So you'll see, you know, there's between the two books, there's a thousand or so references, but it's very much put in a way we can easily understand the data and research and humor is in there too. So scripture humor is in there. Um, so now that I have both books done, the second one will be published. I'll be ready to promote. <laughs> now it makes me think of the hair club. I'm not just the president. I'm the founder kind of, I'm not, I'm not just a member of the chummy church. I'm the founder. That's right. Pastor, pastor Jay. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. That's neat. Do you guys have any more questions for Jen Dai? Uh, no, she's never been on my show before, Stephanie. She actually reached out to me, but she'll probably be on again. And next time making some kale or maybe collars. Oh yeah. <laughs> because those are her favorite. I, I like, I love what I love about collars that they're so sturdy that you can make wraps. Yep. You could exactly. So many ideas for wraps. I love collared wraps. Um, and just using them too, as a base and salad people, like it's so much more filling than romaine or butter lettuce. Like when you have some of those rich greens, as you already talk about, um, inside of a salad base. And we just don't think of it that way. And collards are loaded, just three cups. You have 15 grams of protein and tons of iron and A and so many vitamins and nutrients. And you'll see your hair and skin and nails start to improve as a regular staple with collards. You know, it's funny. I was talking to Dr. Colin Campbell yesterday on the show. We were talking about the when the pandemic started, and there were there were not really food shortages, but people were freaking out and buying like tons of food. The, the, the greens were still there. Like all the meat was gone. All the processed food was gone. But I had no trouble shopping. Me either. I thought it was amazing. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I was going to say too, like with collard greens, like a lot, especially the black culture, the African-American culture, we're used to collard greens, but they're cooked till black. Okay. So that, and you get them at holidays and that's pretty much it. Um, with a bunch of pork or turkey added into there. So it's so neat to kind of go to, you know, real fresh collard greens <laughs> and issues and getting real uh, nutrition in. Yep. Linda says, what does a person do if her hubby criticizes her for being vegan and now her teens eat like him? I say get a new hubby, but you know, what do I know? <laughs> Guess that's not always possible. That's not always possible. 
you know what? You keep doing you. You just keep being happy and keep eating happily uh, for your body and yourself and focus on you. We want to focus on everybody else, right? Um, so that would be my advice. Like that, don't trade them in per se, but you know, over time when people eat the standard American diet fair, guess what? They're going to have health problems. It's just a matter of time. And they're going to be like, Oh, how do I eat again? Right. How do, what do you suggest I do? So it's just a matter of time and just trying to not make them feel shamed or blamed or condemned for the way they're eating because you love them and your love for the relationship and the love of the relationship is so much more than food. Right. All right. Well, some people are saying they're subscribing to your YouTube channel. Thanks so much. I'm just starting out. So thanks so much. (laughs) Of course. We'll put that in the show notes as well. There's a question uh, from, I saw it from, I think it was from Donald about aren't collards. uh, Yeah. Donald says, aren't collards bitter? Yeah, but they're not when you, uh, you know what? Chef AJ recommends California balsamics. Okay. Um, I personally love the pear flavor. So, so that sweet and bitter, like the more you uh, involve different taste buds in your, your food, you're going to have a great eating experience, right? The more you're appealing to the different types of nature of taste in your food. So with the bitter collards, which your liver is so loves like ice cream, your liver and your organs absolutely love bitter. Um, We don't eat enough of it because our taste buds and our brain and our highly palatable hooked brain food um, doesn't necessarily love bitter, it loves sweet or salty or crunchy or chocolatey, right? Um, But when you start to have that um, variety, your organs actually prefer that to any other flavor, that bitter flavor of the grain. So there you go and pair it with one of those California balsamics. They're worth every penny um, because they are made without the sofas and they have um, that pear, you know, like I love the pear one. I just, I was blown away when I first ate that. <laughs> I was like, yeah. wow. Now that sounds delicious. I never thought about putting pear, but just for being on the show, you're getting two free bottles of the flavor of your choice or California balsamic. He has some new flavors now, like ginger and red onion, but the, yeah, that pe- the pear sounds amazing. But the, it's the bitterness that, that it's doing. It means it's doing its job. It's those thylakoids that are going to stop the cravings and block the fat loss. So that, you know, in, in Americans, there are other cultures in the, in the world that embrace that bitter culture. Yeah. They are just used to it. And ju- it's just that we're not used to eating a lot of vegetables in the United States, especially greens. But if you keep introducing them and don't give up, you're going to learn to not, you're going to learn to actually prefer bitter as one of the tastes. And as, as somebody who was a sugar act for 43 years now, I, I prefer savory over sweet. I just, if I'm given a choice, I don't want the sweet taste anymore. I love those dark greens uh, you know, just, just drinking juices like this at the beginning. And maybe if you have to, put, this has no fruit in it, but if you had to put an apple in maybe at the beginning, you can get used to it when you see what it does for your cravings, for your weight, for your mental health. So, I mean, greens, whatever the question, greens are the answer. (laughs) Amen, sister. (laughs) Yeah, let's see. Oh, there's a question. If you've ever spoke, uh, sorry, my chat jumps. Here it is from Wendy. Has she ever presented at any counseling conferences like the ACA? Uh, Not yet. I'm looking forward to that. I love our profession of counsel and healing and coaching and all of that good stuff. And I look forward to supporting um, the professionals to understand this in a more dynamic way. Nice. Let's see. I just, uh, just saw, Georgia says, I call this God's diet, eating the food God designed for our bodies, the food he put in the garden. Yeah. And, and, and I think especially for, I mean, not everybody believes in God. We're not trying to offend you if you don't, but for people that do go to church and believe that, I think it's a great selling point that when they're eating processed food, they're, they're, that's not food. It's not food. Exactly. It's made, you know, I have uh, clients that are food engineers and things of that nature. And they'll tell you when you go into a factory, it is, it's dark, it's dingy, it's artificial lighting. Um, versus real nature's food is real lighting is powerful is going to nourish you back it's going to love you back Um, that other food doesn't and God is love you know from um, our biblical perspective Um, and so you want 
to be more loving towards yourself and grow in love. If you're eating fake food, what does that say about real love in your life with a profit motive, right? If it has a profit motive, if it's just the nature of gain and to addict you because food addicts make the best frequent shoppers, right? Um, then, then what is that really saying about ourselves and what we view in life? So look at it in a higher way, like your food choices predict your destiny. They, they are bringing forth your highest calling um, as you eat well and nurture yourself and nurture your energy, physical energy and purpose. This satanic addictive deception is more than just the food. It's a culture, a way of living um, that doesn't promote the best emotional, spiritual health. It actually promotes entertainment and lethargy. Um, and a lack of completion in life, a lack of progress in life, a lack of joy. Uh, whereas if you learn how to eat well and abundantly, um, Genesis 1, 29 to 30 is one base scripture. Leviticus um, has information 14, Deuteronomy 11. Like there's so many scriptures I can share with you on food in the, from a biblical perspective, but it's more than that. It's really about how can you live your best life? And food is one of the primary sources and vehicles and energy, you know, gainers. And we want to get to completion. We want to have success in life. We don't want to get to 60, 70, 80 and be like, darn, I really wish I listened to chef AJ, <laughs> you know, then, or I, I let this food issue, you know, become so acceptable. And it made me complacent and just watch a bunch of Netflix. You really want to be contributing to life, to helping the cause. I don't know about you, but this world is in trouble in certain ways. And we see people hurting and just depressed and mental illness in one in five. Food has a part to play in that. So let's let's all get hands on deck to support, you know, wholeness, freedom, love, joy, peace in the world. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. And I can't wait to have you come on and cook some collars for us when the new book comes out. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. It's truly an honor and a pleasure. Of course, you're just, you're, you're just, you're just, you're just such a beautiful, I mean, you're beautiful physically, but yeah, I could tell your spirit is really special. So thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. We're going to have a wonderful presentation from a medical doctor named Dr. Lynette Moore. Thanks so much, Jen Dye. Take care. <laughs>